But if if everybody is able to validate everything along the way, you're going to have a blockchain, uh, a chain of records that's going to be very, um, very trustworthy. But you know, like like you're saying, there's going to be bad actors no matter where you go, and, and we're going to constantly have to guard against them. But you're right. If government were to all of a sudden start putting all of the legal records and all of the you know transferring of titles and transferring of of uh, license plates from one car to the next or all of that information on a blockchain and make it publicly available. Boy, I mean, that could be really, really good. Um, it does cut down the graft. In fact, one, one story I can tell you was an article I read about a couple of years ago about a, uh, a municipality in Central America who was, um, they had, a large developer coming in and the large developer had started becoming predatory and started taking people's lands because they didn't have any paperwork, any real title to any of the lands that their families had been living on for generations. These people, for the most part, don't even own this land on which they eke out their living. It's owned by unscrupulous landowners who have acquired these sites over many years and who charge outrageous rents to people to continue to live here. Well, you and I know on a moral sense that if their family's been living on that for generations, that doesn't mean they don't own it just because they don't have paperwork. And so to combat it, they, they created, created a blockchain specifically for public records and they started going around and recording all of the verbal deeds and the landlines and all of the information concerning all the properties that were owned by all the people in their neighborhoods and communities. And they were able to then, you know, force the developers to purchase the land if they needed it or wanted it at a fair price and everybody could get their fair share and then, you know, move and go on to areas that they needed to, to let development happen. But at the same time, not just be forced off their lands and into poverty. Well, okay, I'm going to tell you an actual story that happened with the Ethereum blockchain then. Um, because the Ethereum blockchain has a thing called smart contracts, and smart contracts are, are written by programmers, and uh, programmers are people too, and they're, they're fallible just like everyone else. Well, in this particular case, and I can't remember the exact name of it, they created a DAP, which is a distributed application, um, actually, it was a distributed autonomous application, meaning it just ran on its own once they let it go. And a group of people found an exploit where they could th quickly deposit money into the, the application. And instead of them being, using it to purchase something, they were able to use it to purchase something and then quickly withdraw it. So they had created a double spend issue, but they were exploiting the double spend issue. And because of it, because it was a distributed autonomous application and it was on the blockchain, all the transactions became immutable. And all of a sudden this one person's public key was building up millions of dollars. And so the Ethereum council got together at that point, and this is fairly early on in Ethereum's development. Um, they got together and they, they said, we can't allow this to stand. We've got a lot of other people's money and a lot of the trust involved with the Ethereum blockchain to, to not let this happen. So they actually did <clears throat> manually fork the Ethereum blockchain. And even though it was a proof of work and proof of work always builds on the longest fork, okay, they forced the blockchain to, to fork and they closed the other fork so that it couldn't be built upon anymore. And they made it fork just before the creation of this distributed application. And then they worked very hard to get other people's money transferred into the back out of that application, out of the hands of that other public key and back into the rightful owners. They were about 90% successful in that. Um, 
but it was a very serious black eye to the Ethereum blockchain because of, you know, two things. Number one, the fact that it could be exploited. But number two, all of a sudden, this idea of immutability, you know, became, you know, just flew out the window. In other words, if the owners of the blockchain or the programmers of the blockchain could deliberately fork it before any particular transaction, what you're saying is that blockchain isn't immutable anymore. And so um, it, it, that one's been debated for, you know, for the last three years since it happened. And I don't think anybody's really come up with a good specific answer for it. Um, they did what they had to do at the time to preserve the Ethereum blockchain. The Ethereum blockchain would have died had it not. Uh, had they not made that choice, I'm pretty certain of that. If you enjoyed the content that you saw today and would like to help me grow the channel, hover your mouse over my picture to the left and click on subscribe. There are also other videos showing on the screen that you might enjoy.